Welcome everyone to our virtual lecture this evening. Um, our presenter tonight is the public archaeologist for Utah for the Utah State Historic Preservation Office, where she works with organizations and communities to preserve and protect archaeology across the state. She earned her master's degree in archaeology and cultural resource management at Utah State University, where she used tree ring and radiocarbon dating to investigate um, investigate behavioral patterns of the prehistoric Fremont of the Unita Basin. Tonight, she's gonna to share more about the cultural history of what is now Smith Family Archaeological Preserve, which is a conservancy preserve on the west side of Utah Lake that contains hundreds of petroglyphs. So I would like to introduce Elizabeth Hora. Welcome Elizabeth and thank you so much for coming tonight. Hey, thank you. Thank you so much for hosting me. I'm gonna start sharing my screen and we can dive right into it because this is this is kind of a long one, guys. I'm not gonna lie, you're gonna be drinking from quite a fire hose. Oops, I apologize. That is just the middle of the presentation. Let's start again. Okay. So my title tonight, my talk tonight is titled Understanding Ancient Life at Utah Lake, the Culture History of the Smith Family Archaeological Preserve. Um, and before we get too far into it, um, it is our honor and responsibility to acknowledge all who meet with us at the State Historic Preservation Office and that we gather on land that is sacred to all indigenous people who came before us in this vast crossroads for Utes, Goshutes, Paiutes, Shoshone, Navajo and Hopi people and their ancestors. It has been their stewardship for time immemorial to care for this land and all of its inhabitants. We honor their memory, their physical presence in our state today, and their ancestors' presence here in spirit. And we do so in our reverence for their resilience in preserving their connections to the creator. We honor the people, we honor the land. And so tonight, what I'm going to bring you is a little slice of life out at the Smith Family Archaeological Preserve. In case you don't know who I am, and I see some friends um, saying hi in the chat, and hi Beth, hi Chris. Um, <laughs> in case you don't know who I am, my name is Elizabeth Hora. I'm public archaeologist here at the Utah State Historic Preservation Office. So I'm like a state archaeologist, but what I do is explicitly publicly oriented. So that's my phone number, and that phone number routes to my cell phone. So. You know, you can give me a call anytime, day or night, but like I, I probably won't respond at like 1 a.m., but it will go to my phone. So I'm available for you if you have any questions, if you're if you're coming to Utah, if you're a visitor, if you're a researcher, if, if you just want to know more, um, I'm, I'm very open and accessible. Uh, Email is probably the easiest way to get a hold of me, as it is, I think, most people these days. Um, but yeah, so my job is um, not just studying everything that archaeology has to offer, but finding meaningful ways to bring it to people, finding ways to interpret it for folks and get it out to the public. So um, working with the Smith Preserve has been an incredible way to work with a whole bunch of people who know and love this sort of stuff, particularly prehistoric rock imagery, and then bring it to the people of Utah. One of the biggest challenges that I had when I moved to Utah um, a little over 10 years ago, and when I first started trying to learn about the region's prehistory was that I could not find any plain language expla explanation of what was going on out here. Once I went to grad school and I learned how to read academic and scientific papers, it started to make more sense. Um, in particular, I want to promote Steve Sims's book. It's an enormous help trying to conceptualize what the lives of ancient people actually looked like. So I highly recommend you seek out a book called Ancient Peoples of the Great Basin and Colorado Plateau um, if you wanna learn more about this place's history. Oops, there we go. So I've tried to write the presentation today that I needed when I first started off in Utah archeology. span I will try to pull in a bunch of different threads for you tonight, starting with the natural environment, and then pull in generalized models for human exploitation of that environment, and then overlay all that framework with some of the actual archeological sites that we know of. Um, so even though this is a, a presentation specifically on the Smith Family Archeological Preserve, I'm actually gonna hit that last. 
I think that once you have a solid foundation for how people were living across the whole region, a lot of things are going to start to click for you for when we finally do turn to the preserve and start looking at some of that rock imagery. Utah has over 13,000 years of human history, but fortunately for us today, we're just going to look at the 4,000 or so years, <laughs> just 4,000, um, when people were making rock imagery at the Smith Preserve, and this time right about here. Um, but have it in the back of your mind that when we do introduce humans onto this landscape um, that we're going to build together here in a few minutes, that these folks likely had not just generational ties to the land, um, but millennial ties to the land. As the environment changed across time, people did more than just adapt. They discovered ways to thrive and how to control the world that they built together. All right, enough preamble. So where are we in space and time and what did this place look like? Our story takes place around Utah Lake, but we need to zoom out a little bit in order to understand Utah Lake's place in people's lives. The lake itself is and was incredibly rich and a diverse resource. It is the largest freshwater body for hundreds of miles around, which is really important when you're situated on the Western edge of one of North America's largest deserts, the Great Basin. This lake has a few major inlets that brought cold, crystal clear water down from snow-capped peaks in the Wasatch Range and the Uinta Mountains. And it brought that water down into the valley and with that water came fish. These rivers, streams and other inlets became places not only to get those good omega fatty acids from fish, but also teamed with plant resources for food and medicine, just excellent duck hunting, um, and they're all around just beautiful, peaceful places to be. So our map here shows a little bit of Wyoming, Colorado, um, Idaho up top there. Uh, Nevada's labeled as Great Basin. And then Utah Lake is just that little kind of crescent of light blue. North of that is the Great Salt Lake. Um, it is as salty as you think it is. It's probably a little saltier because it's in the process of shrinking right now with our, our current uh, climate situation. So this is the largest body of fresh water for so far around. Um, a lot of the other little tiny lakes you see on here, if you can see them, those are, those are actually modern reservoirs. So this was a natural reservoir, super important. From the earliest days, marshlands all across the Great Basin have been really, really important to people. I cannot overstate. Around Utah Lake, we find marshes at the Provo River Inlet, Hobble Creek, American and Spanish Forks, and there's an outlet to the Jordan River. And so the Jordan River is what is actually draining Utah Lake to the Great Salt Lake to the north. Archaeologists describe these marshlands as prehistoric grocery stores. And just think of all the things that you can find in a marsh. Foods like plants, obviously, uh, waterfowl and fish, that's always good stuff. And of course, fresh water, but also reeds for building materials. Like if you needed to build a boat to hunt all these great things, clay for making pottery gets deposited there. And as I'm learning, ochre gets deposited along the waterways too. Um, plants for making medicines and even feathers for personal adornment and for important ceremonies. Being able to have access to marshlands at strategic times of year like migratory bird season or when cutthroat uh, trout are spawning, like here, um, that timing would be really important. At different times in history, we'll see that people use different strategies to make sure that they were here at the marshlands at what they determined to be opportune times. The western side of the lake, that was the east, the east, and all the north and south, lush green verdant, good, good stuff. The west side, totally different character. This is the upper Sonoran Desert. It is the Great Basin. It has hot summers, pretty cold in the winters, and dry all the time. Kind of like in the southwest, we've got that 
bimodal distribution of rain, where we tend to have a little bit of a monsoon, a weak monsoon in the summer, and then we get snow in the winter. But I mean, we are not talking a lot of precipitation <laughs> over time. And so Utah Lake hugs that eastern rim of the Great Basin, and it extends. Um, sorry, so Utah Lake hugs that eastern rim and um, the Great Basin then extending all the way westward, all the way to um, the Carson Range and the Sierra Nevadas, just ripples of north-south trending mountain ranges and in between flat-bottomed bases, basins. These desert hills have resources of a different kind, exposed toolstone outcrops nestled among the limestones and sandstones, and ranging herds of deer and antelope. Also in the Great Basin, people were using plant resources like pickleweed in the valley bottoms and pinion nuts on the high elevations um, that are, are up in those mountain ranges. Just like timing was important for the marsh resources, timing is important for these basin and range resources too. For example, the fall rut is the perfect time for hunting pronghorn antelope. The males gather smaller herds together in groups of up to like 100 animals. And that way, the pronghorn males benefit because they can mate with more females more quickly. But that also means there are big groups of animals clustered really predictably on the landscape. And Native Americans would band together in the fall to drive these animals into stone and brush corrals for slaughter. So if you were in the right place at the right time, the desert was a very profitable place to be. With this much variety and opportunity all around Utah Lake, there are lots of different ways for people to take advantage of nature's bounty and to prosper. And we see here in the Utah Lake area that people use different strategies and they use different strategies over time. And I'm just gonna focus on um, the two clusters of time when we have um, occupations at the Smith Preserve that left rock imagery. And so those are the late archaic and the Fremont eras. And so now we're gonna dive into looking at how people in those two eras used the landscape. So now our map is showing sites that we can definitively date to the archaic. And many of these are dated to the late archaic. So you can see clusters around the Jordan River and Current Creek, where you're gonna find those marsh resources. And for those of you who aren't local, <laughs> I did provide this. So uh, Current Creek is that inlet of fresh water. The Jordan River on the north is that outlet of fresh water. Still to this day, marshy, marshy, marshy. Um, and so we also see that there are other clusters on this map showing that people were focusing their time out to the west as well. That interface between mountain and valley, that's where the hunting's really good in the fall and um, I suppose a little into the early winter, but really the fall. So in both locales, people lived in configurations that archeologists call temporary camps. This means that these sites were not permanent settlements, but they were really nice campsites. The groups of people occupied for a few days or a few weeks um, and then would move on from. Some of these camps we think might've been used just once, um, but others we can see uh, by traces in the archeology span that these sites hosted people again and again and again over hundreds and sometimes over thousands of years. So if you've got a really sweet hunting site, I mean, if any of you guys are hunters, you know, like if you've got that really good hunting site, you go back again and again, you bring your family, you kind of bequeath it onto the next generation. So in the late archaic, people moved around a lot following changing abundances of plants and animals. In the summer, people traveled in small groups of maybe just one or two families. Um, and they moved fairly frequently to take advantage of rapid cycling, plant and animal resources. And so those are probably those marshy areas that are in the pink. Those are probably our, our summer and our spring camps. In the fall, people were clustering together to take advantage of these animals and, and participate in that communal hunting, like that antelope drive. So when we look at these places, we see that not only are they differentiated in time and they're differentiated by what resources people were targeting, they're also differentiated by the size of the group that is coming together in these places. Um, so in the fall, people would cluster up to take part in communal hunting. And in the winter, even people gathered into large groups in the mountains near where they had stored pinion nuts. 
um, spring was a lean time um, when your food reserves are pretty thin right around now when you're kind of running low on your stores, but there's not really a lot growing right now. Um, so spring's a lean time when groups, groups would scatter back into those smaller family units and disperse. But then as the weather warmed, the cycling of gathering and mobility started all over again. Archaeologists reconstruct archaic life through the artifacts and sites that archaic people left behind. So from groundstone, like in the upper left here, we can tell not only what people were eating, like Indian rice grass or amaranth, but we can tell that people intended to come back to the site again and again. So pieces like this matate, groundstone, some of my favorite, pieces like this matate in the upper left, they would be lugged to a camp that's rich in plant and animal resources and a camp that you think you're gonna come back to and chipped and ground into the shape that that user liked best, putting all this extra effort in to choose just the right stone and form it to one's ideal shape tells archeologists that this matate wasn't just used once, but it was stored at the site for future use. The person who made this matate intended to return to the site across their lifetime and maybe even pass this tool down to their children and their grandchildren. Grinding stones like this show us that people started to tether themselves to points on the landscape. And that's a, a really big difference in the archaic from any time before. And archaeologists also find a lot of chipstone tools, like these up here. This, this I think might actually be a potsherd. Might be a chipstone tool, hard to say. Um, so the archaic toolkit has a few major components to it. It has dart points that would be thrown with the help of an atlatl at prey, knives and scrapers for butchering animals, choppers and expedient tools for cutting, hacking, and taking care of small cutting tasks. We also find uh, chipstone awls for making clothing and burins for etching and engraving items. During the late archaic, um, we had a style of rock imagery called Great Basin Style by we creative archeologists. Um, and that is shown a little bit here. Um, so the Great Basin Style of rock imagery was super widespread from Reno to Provo, all across the basin. These were abstract designs and they could be rectilinear or curving. Um, and although they are beautiful, they don't have a clearly understood meaning among archeologists today. These are pretty ancient. And so perhaps their meaning is mostly lost, but just as likely there are members of Native American tribes and bands who can decipher these rock imagery panels. And for a variety of reasons, choose not to make that knowledge public. What I can tell you, is that the very fact of this style being so widespread says something about how far individual people would travel across their lifetime. The ability to walk across the Great Basin and still be able to read the signposts like this can in a sense indicate that there's some degree of commonality between people. So even though people, we don't expect that they would have spoken the same language um, and it's likely they didn't even consider themselves members of the same group, they had similar symbols and potentially a similar ideology behind that. Okay, it's a lot and that's just one, it's one half, <laughs> that's the archaic. Now we're gonna turn to the Fremont. Okay, so after the archaic um, comes what we archeologists call the Fremont period. And so that's starting around 400 to 500 AD. Around then the archaic model that had served people for literally thousands of years, stopped being a good way to make a living. The environment was changing. And starting around 500 AD, the Great Basin and Colorado Plateau started to experience really profound droughts. And this period of just monstrous droughts lasted for a thousand years. We call this period the medieval climactic anomaly. And archeologists believe that it is one of the major reasons that we see people switching from that mobile archaic lifestyle of hunting and gathering to a more sedentary and agrarian life. Um, you see it really prominently in the Southwest in the Four Corners region and in uh, Northwestern Mexico. Here you see it, but with a twist. Um, so 
in general, here's why we think this change happens. When it gets dry, um, your plants and animals become a little less predictable on the landscape. But if you plant some corn and tend to it, you'll eat all winter, you'll have enough. You've gotta put in the labor though. I mean, those of us who have any backyard gardens know um, that once you plant some veggies, you're also gonna get rabbits. So that was probably a nice bonus for all of these new Fremont farmers out there. Um, okay, so turning again to our map though. Uh, these dots are yellow instead of green um, to indicate that time has passed, to indicate that now we are in the Fremont. So here in the Utah Valley, um, the change that we see from that archaic pattern is pretty pronounced. And I'll overlay them later so that you can see how, how different these are. So we're gonna first take a look back at the Provo River Delta here. This is a hopping metropolitan downtown Fremont land. And if you recall, um, we actually didn't have any sites in this area at all. And now all of these indicators of sites are piled up one on top of the other. And I'll tell you something else, we don't have the full record of them because so much of this is private land and so much of this has been um, tilled already. This is where a lot of LDS pioneers came to settle as well. Um, and we have accounts of people being like, dang pit houses and mounds are screwing up my fields. So um, they've been they've been fairly leveled. Um, so uh, yeah, so these um, these again, they're they're not temporary camps. These are village sites. These are hamlets and villages. Um, these are permanent homes called pit houses. And so the location of this on kind of a floodplain and the um, switch from temporary houses like wikiups to permanent homes like pit houses, not to mention the corn. <laughs> These are all markers for agriculture. Um, just like in modern times, like this broad sandy terrace above, um, above Provo River was a really great place to live if you were committed to raising crops. So also we still do have a lot of sites scattered around. Um, there are many temporary camps out here still. The sedentary and the mobile lifeways in the Fremont operated together to create a super flexible system that endured for nearly a millennium. Okay. While I love some archaic archaeology, I'm a Fremont archaeologist at heart, so I wanted to share with you guys some more detail about Fremont material culture and what that meant for um, sort of the, the fabric and the feel of Fremont lives. Probably the most important thing to keep in mind is that the Fremont did have this unique marriage of farming and hunting and gathering. Um, we find, for example, um, uh, stores of corn stashed high in the Uinta Mountains. Um, those stores would allow hunters in the hunter and gatherer land um, to extend their hunting trips, but they got that, that corn from their communities down in the Uinta Basin. Um, farmers and foragers worked together to support each other and um, they were integrated into a community and that made their society super resilient. I should also say the other flip side of that, what do the farmers get in return? They got trade goods from like hundreds of miles away, you know, turquoise, shell, we don't have any shell out here. Um, a network of mobile foragers were bringing things into the villages and the villagers in turn we're supporting that economy by providing reliable food for when times get tough as a forager. So that resiliency, that sort of give and take um, is, a, is a real cornerstone of Fremont life. Okay, so who were the Fremont? Well, if you are what you eat, then a whole bunch of corn, beans, and squash. Um, in anthropological terms, how people get their food um, structures their economy, their technology, where they live and who they live with. It's so fundamental to understanding any human society. So you know now that the Fremont had that dual nature of farming and foraging. How many people were engaged in each activity and what segments of society those may be could change to serve any number of different pressure release valve purposes. People in society who don't find mobility particularly easy so those with young children um, or those who were injured or elderly, they can find gainful employment in a sedentary community. 
younger adults who want to gain some social standing, maybe impress somebody, or who just want to escape small town life for other reasons, they could join up with foragers and get some miles under their feet, log some cool stories. Who among us hasn't done something stupid in their 20s that we just coast on for the rest of our lives? You get some good stories. Having these choices meant not only did the Fremont, um, it meant that they could uh, overcome like any harvest or hunt, um, any bad harvest or hunt, I should say, but it also meant that they had other choices and opportunities available to them as individuals. Archaeologically, it's sometimes hard to see that, but it's important to remember that what we see as artifacts are the aggregate of just a million decisions made over the lifetimes of lots and lots and lots of people. So um, sometimes you find some pretty one-off things in the archeological record because people are people. Since the Fremont had such a variety of ways to make a living, they also had different household items suited for their lifestyles. When you start looking at household items, um, you kind of start to get a feel for what everyday life might have been like. Let's look at some common items that the Fremont used. And um, just a quick break here too. Uh, my next slide actually is Q&A about Fremont and archaic people. So that's gonna be kind of the halfway point of this where we'll pivot. So we'll have an opportunity for a short Q&A and I know April's gonna um, take a look at the chat and the QA. So just heads up. Now's a good time to start formulating some things if you have questions. Okay, for mod stuff. Um, pretty much everyone is gonna need to transport, store, and cook their food. Remember, food is like undergirds everything in life. Um, in a typical Fremont household, people used baskets to transport things, um, particularly dry goods like nuts and seeds. Um, we see that there's a lot more basketry and sort of lighter stuff when you compare it to people further south, um, who maybe were using more pottery. When you compare it to people further north, they didn't have a heck of a lot of pottery in their lives anyway. So again, Fremont is kind of that middle ground um, doing two things. So the basket in the center panel, um, that was found at Mantles Cave in Northwest Colorado, which is about a few miles from the Utah state line. Caves are pretty much the only places that archeologists find fragile things like baskets and ropes. But here in Utah, we've got a lot of them because we've got a, that dry <laughs> upper Sonoran life. Um, so farmers and hunter-gatherers alike relied on monos and matates, like the one featured here um, on the left, sorry. So although we tend to think of people grinding corn in, gr grinding just corn, I suppose, into flour from which to make um, cakes and stews, the Fremont also used their monos and matates to grind up way more than just corn. One staple of people's diets was crickets. Um, also things like pickleweed, Indian rice grass, but crickets are the good one, high in protein, crunchy. Um, people would dry crickets, grind them into a cricket flour and combine them with sweet berries or savory pinion nuts to make a sort of hard tack granola bar thing. Um, and I should mention, that uh, that is a, looks like a Mesa Verde or four corner style uh, piece of pottery there. That's not Fremont, that's Puebloan, but I think it, it, it was the image I could find that conveyed that people were also using pottery. So we, we do have pottery in the Fremont world. Uh, pottery makes appearances almost exclusively on these um, long-term habitation sites. Sometimes you'll find them in temporary camps that are an easy walk, but Pottery is heavy and breakable. So we usually just see it in villages. Um, so aside from tools that people were using to make food or get food or cook food, um, archeologists also have found things like these bone gaming pieces in the upper left um, and this woven juniper bark mat in the bottom right. Um, the woven juniper bark mat uh, is something that I've, I've personally found in some shelters and it really speaks to me on a deep level because even though I'm an archeologist, I do not like the feeling of dirt and grit on me. And so to make a temporary shelter, like an alcove, even more comfortable, you weave yourself one of these juniper bark mats and you could just shake it out, flick all the dirt and dust off it, lay it down, 
way softer, more comfortable than just that sandstone. And, um, you can, you know, uh, indulge your, your tactile sensitivity side, like I do and just not get that dirty. Um, and with the gaming pieces, uh, people would pass the time, like we all do, uh, playing games. Um, but these gaming pieces are made from, um, an animal's long bone is what it looks like. And they're inscribed with lines and designs. We don't really know a lot about what gaming looked like in the ancient world. Um, but you know, we can, we can recognize things like this as gaming pieces. Okay. So the last topic in the whole, the whole latter half here, um, is to understand how the area known as the Smith Family Preserve fits into all of this, the, the archaic and the Fremont worlds. Um, but I know that this has been a really big information drop. <laughs> I wanna take a quick pause for just a few minutes um, to answer any questions that you have about Fremont and archaic lives. We're gonna see a whole bunch more of this stuff too, by the way. So I'm gonna stop sharing for just a second so that we can have a, just a talk. Okay, so in the Q&A, I think one of the first things that uh, is, uh, we should cover is kind of basic. How does Fremont get its name? What peoples are represented in this culture? Yeah, so um, the Fremont are named for the Fremont River and the Fremont River is named for John C. Fremont. So the Fremont were first identified as a distinct archeological culture by Earl Morris at the beginning half of the 20th century. I don't, I do not remember the date, but ballpark at a hundred years ago. Um, he realized really quickly that he had this, um, this group of people who were distinct from the folks that he knew in um, the Four Corners area. Um, and so in terms of what peoples are represented, the Fremont is what we call an archeological culture. There, there was no period in time that you could go back to and ask someone living in Bear Lake and ask someone living in um, St. George, which are the two opposite ends of Utah, ask them who they were and probably get an answer of like, oh, I'm, we're the same, right? Like we call it the Fremont because we see that they have similar archeological signatures. Um, importantly being that they are agriculturalists, they're using corn, beans, and squash and that they are um, incorporating that highly mobile lifestyle as well. That's really the hallmark of what is Fremont. Um, you can get some other material culture indicators as well, like um, grayware pottery is a big one. Um, eventually bow and arrow in the Fremont period becomes a marker. And so we've got certain projectile points called Rose Spring um, and Bull Creek and all these others. But um, ultimately like, it's an emic versus etic category, if you guys know that one, like people on the inside wouldn't have necessarily defined themselves as the same. We are so far on the outside and we're working with such limited data that we probably clump a lot of people together in, um, in ways that are, are not appropriate. So it's a long answer, I, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so one of our, um, our viewers says, there is a huge number of Fremont sites on the map do these dots reflect excavations or largely surface site surveys or what percentage of each? Yeah, so largely surface surveys. Um, and I don't really know what the percentage would be, but I mean, very few sites get excavated out here, particularly around um, Utah Lake, because it's not, I mean, there's private land that is like really heavily developed, but a lot of the public land isn't very developed. The private land on that eastern side um, is where you're going to find a lot of the long-term pit houses. Um, that's probably bad data in the sense that we don't have 100% survey coverage of that area because it's private land. We don't want to freak anyone out by saying, I'm from the government. I'm going to look at your stuff. Freaks people out in the West. We don't do that. Um, <laughs> and so you know, it's mostly site survey. It's a lot of people who have reported, um, but you know, it's fairly spotty. On the Western side, um, we have big block surveys. Very, very infrequently do we have excavations. And part of why across the state is that we don't have a lot of deposition. Um, we just don't make a lot of dirt out here. Uh, 
if you get more than 20 centimeters on a site, you've really struck it big. So I don't know the percentages, but I'll say very largely um, surface surveys. Okay, the next question is, until the three sisters arrived from Mexico and presumably Peru, was there any food that could allow the Fremont to live in a village? Hmm. I mean, probably not. Um, probably not, just because uh, the foods that people were eating, like um, potatoes and amaranth, pickleweed, rice grass, pinion nuts, um, all sorts of nuts and berries, service berries, um, silver, silver snowberry, buffalo berry, all of those um, were not domesticated. So you get more bang for your buck walking around, picking up stuff and popping it in your mouth. If you tried to plant one of these things, um, they may not produce fruit or any edible food in the first year. And if you planted an acre of it, you might not get enough food out of that acre, enough like food biomass to sustain yourself. Corn, as you remember, was originally teosinte. It was a really, really small little guy. And they grew that artificially. Um, that was not natural selection. That was artificial selection from humans. We genetically engineered these foods. And so people up here had not gone through the effort of genetically engineering any foods because like they didn't need to. The world was a cornucopia of constantly changing yummy stuff. Um, so when corn, when, when the environment got bad, people who knew already what was going on in like Mesa Verde, who knew what was, they already knew what was going on in Aztec, like Steve Luxon will say, everybody knew everything. They knew all of this stuff. And they said, Hey man, can we, can we get some of your corn from you? Cause it's getting hungry up here. Um, but that's a really great question. Yeah, there just was not food available that would have supported village life. And the next question is, did Fremont people use tool reeds to make baskets and decoys like people did on the Western portion of the Great Basin? I don't have any, um, I, I have not seen anything like that. But boy, howdy, I uh, would love to. And I suspect that the answer is probably yes. Um, we're, we most likely do have um, Thule Reed boats is, is sort of what we as archaeologists out here assume. I don't know that we've necessarily seen that. Um, and then if you guys don't know what, what Terry is referring to, these ducks are amazing. Um, so they found them at a place called Stillwater Marsh over in Nevada. And they are the size and shape of little ducks floating on the water. They're made with tule reeds where you bend the reeds to create a structure of a duck. And you think to yourself, that's a lousy duck decoy. If I was a duck, I'd know that's made of tule. Here's where it's metal. They would skin a duck that they already had and stretch that duck skin over the tule mock-up. Now you got a real good duck. And so you send a few of those out onto your lake you go out there in your Thule boat, you get yourself a nice ghillie suit and you wait and go get yourself some great ducks. Good, good fatty ducks. <laughs> well, that's probably where we've got to leave it so that I can show you guys some, some rock imagery, if that's okay. You got but, it. I'll save some of the other questions till the end. Yeah, because this is where it gets really cool, guys. Um, I'm excited for this. Okay. So now we're going to zip back over to sites and the preserve. So I told you that this map would come back. It's our archaic and Fremont period site map. Those green dots, there are archaic sites and the Fremont dots are yellow. So remember those archaic folks were exclusively hunter gatherers. And so their dots are our temporary camps and they're based around places with seasonal resources like game, um, or plants for medicines. The yellow Fremont dots represent both hunting and gathering and temporary camps and ag agricultural sites. So there are a few places around Utah Lake that look like they've always been favored areas. One such hotspot is right here in an area we call the Lake Mountains. It's on the western side of Utah Lake. 
And it's in this area that we find the Smith Preserve. The Adelbert Doyle Smith Family Archaeological Preserve has been privately owned for generations by the Smith family before they generously donated it to the Archaeological Conservancy. The preserve covers just under 200 acres on the shore of Utah Lake, where two knolls rise together. I've got little maps of each knoll. These knolls, called the North and South Knoll, again, we are super creative as a people, um, but the North and South Knoll together create, contain rather well over 200 boulders with prehistoric rock imagery on them. Many of these boulders have more than one panel on them. And many of these panels have more than one element on them. So we are not done counting how many individual elements there are out here, but a conservative guess puts it in the thousands. Why are there so many boulders with rock imagery out here? Okay, the categorical trinity in archeology. span um, one way to think about it is to think like an old timey detective with means, motive, and opportunity. Um, in the case of an archeological site like the Smith Preserve, we want to determine the means, motive, and opportunity of not just one thing happening, but the decisions made by potentially hundreds or even thousands of people over time coming to the preserve. So category one, did people have the means to make rock imagery here? Boy, howdy, did they ever. So if you take a look at this awesome map, courtesy of the National Map by USGS, um, you can see sort of, this is called North Knoll, this whole guy here. And this is South Knoll that kind of arcs up. And so you can see whoop, a little bit of an amphitheater in the middle. Um, the, the knolls have linear outcrops of sandstone and limestone, and specifically, the Butterfield Peak Sandstone is what people were targeting for creating rock imagery on. Um, and we'll show you why in just a few minutes. So it's hard to see the outcrops at this scale. So I drew these blue lines where you can, you can see on this digital elevation model where there's like pushed up outcrops of um, sandstone and limestone out of, um, out of the knoll. There's just a ton of them. There's just a lot out here. Um, lots and lots and lots of canvas was available. And to create rock imagery, you need only a hammer and a chisel or pigments. Um, and so the means are available really at almost all points in prehistory and history. There would have been times in the late Pleistocene when this area was under prehistoric Lake Bonneville and therefore unavailable unless you had a 13,000 year old scuba suit. Um, but at all other times, it's open season. So these, these rock outcrops, um, really old rock had been uplifted many, many years ago. This did not happen recently. Um, they were covered up by water at some point, but any time after that was when people were here, good to go. Um, so we're gonna jump over the motive category right now uh, cause that's the hard one. So we're gonna jump over to opportunity. Um, so without a doubt, people had the opportunity to come out to the knolls. So looking again at our map, sorry, it's a little smaller at this time. Tons of people were tromping around Utah Lake all the time, looking for fishing spots, hunting grounds, tool stone to make chipstone tools out of, on and on. And remember too, people had not just those generational ties to the land, but ties to the land that extended back for millennia. People knew this place intimately and came here frequently for other reasons. And so that gave them the opportunity to be somewhere that provided them the means for making rock imagery. Okay, so what motivates people to create rock imagery? Um, this is notoriously difficult for archeologists to get at. <laughs> Our science is really good at finding functional interpretations but rock imagery doesn't necessarily have a function that is visible archeologically. Um, so we consider that people had myriad reasons for creating rock imagery. Um, and I wanna emphasize that these reasons can work together at any time. So you can mix and match and pile them on and they can change at any given time. Again, we had 4,000 years of people coming out here. 
Um, so it's, it might not necessarily be the case that all of these things were at play all the time. Uh, for example, one person's uh, pectin uh, element or, or image marking a, a rite of passage may become their descendants anchor for creating a sacred space many years later. Um, meaning changes over time, right? Uh, the meaning of these places has the ability to change and it has the ability to be hidden from view, right? Like you can create meanings that um, you don't write down, that you only share with a certain group of people. And that group of people may disband, may abandon these, uh, these ceremonies, these rites. Things happen. Um, and these sites have the ability to embody many different meanings to different segments of the same society or group, right? So again, you can pile these things on again and again. Um, there is a, a site that I think many of you know uh, called Tatuvani outside of Tuba City. It was a, a Hopi rite of passage as, as young initiates were going down from the Hopi mesas over um, to, uh, to the Grand Canyon to gather salt. Later, that became a site of medicine and healing for uh, Navajo people who, who live there now, um, where they will go out and they will obliterate one of these images um, as, a, as a way to heal themselves of, of some kind of sickness or disease. So different groups of people could have been out here over time creating different kinds of meanings. Um, within the same segment of society, you might have two different, uh, two different uses of the same area. Guys, it's just a lot. And um, it does feel like a cop out. I'm not gonna lie. Uh, I cannot tell you motivation, unfortunately. But I can tell you that given the thousands of images out here, people were sufficiently motivated. <laughs> um, so just to, to give you something a little more helpful to latch on to, I've got more images of uh, the rock imagery out at the Smith Preserve. Um, and hopefully it'll help you remember some key points about the presentation too. So people first started leaving their mark on the Smith Preserve during the late archaic, really no earlier than about 4,000 years ago. These people inherited the land from their ancestors who had already been here for up to 8,000 years. It might not be clear why people began leaving their mark in the form of these petroglyphs, but they were following a pattern of behavior that was sweeping across the Great Basin. People were creating rectangular and curving abstract designs. As archaeologists, we call this all Great Basin style rock imagery, although this huge category could obscure important differences about who people were and what the imagery meant to them. We assume, based on broad similarities, that there was a similarly broad common understanding underpinning this style. Okay, and as the environment became drier and harsher, people changed how they were living. Um, and so we call this this our uh, this climate shift that our mid <laughs> sorry <laughs> we call this climate shift the medieval climactic anomaly, which is the easiest thing to say. Um, and then we call the people who were living in this time who had this archaeological culture the Fremont. So I didn't really get into Fremont rock imagery before, um, but during this shift, we do see a change in rock imagery as well, a change in how people were expressing themselves. Um, we stop seeing so much of that abstract design and we start seeing that people were creating images of people more and animals more often. It's a little hard to see on this rock um, and there's, there's a lot going on around it, but we've got this bighorn sheep right here. I mean, it's probably a bighorn sheep. He's got some big horns. Um, an archeologist would say it's a, it's a quadruped. It's a four legged thing. Um, I only got three legs. Bighorn sheep, we'll call it. So um, we also have a lot of deer featured on these. Um, these animals were favorite motifs, even in areas where people don't, where we don't expect that um, people hunted these things much. Out here, they were probably hunting deer and probably hunting some bighorn sheep, but there's a lot more antelope. Um, one of my personal favorite designs uh, that we have found out at the Smith Preserve is this recurring 
I'm just going to say fishing net. <laughs> I was trying to find a different word, but that looks an awful lot like a fishing net to me. Um, and we do see uh, other evidence that people were um, fishing out at the preserve, or at least that they were discarding their fishing implements there. Um, so the Smith family who had owned this property for years um, had collected off of it some artifacts that they found, and some of them are fishing net weights. So they're small stones that have a groove around them so that you can tie the end of your fishing net to it. Uh, fishing is also cool because it shows again that communal, it's, it's a kind of communal hunting. Um, it takes a lot of human hours to create a fishing net from gathering all of the materials for it to making them into cordage to knotting them and having people help you stretch it out and having people help you throw it, right? So um, a lot of different hands and a lot, of, um, a lot of time and attention goes into fishing nets. Fishing nets can be shared across a large family group. They could be passed down for generations. And so we see that fishing nets tie people together. Um, so I think that, you know, we've, we see a few of these different motifs and I think that they're, they're just really lovely. Um, here we have a mysterious little critter. So to me, and again, I can't really interpret this, but this, this guy here looks really similar to some horned snakes or horned lizards that we have um, mostly, I think, of in the Nine Mile Canyon area, if you guys know where that is. It's another, um, uh, it's another Fremont metropolis out towards uh, Price, Utah, and Duchesne, Utah. So um, this horned serpent or horned lizard, um, horned snake, I mean, you guys have probably heard a lot of other um, tales from you know, the area of the Great Basin in the Southwest, where even today there are tales of, of horned lizards and horned serpents. So um, I just wanted to share that little guy. I think he's pretty cool. I don't really have a lot to say there. Um, <laughs> I don't know. This one's really hard to see too. So I've actually drawn it twice. But um, this beautiful picture, I'm sad to see it go. That's a view of May looking at uh, Timpanogos, which is a sacred mountain. Um, this looks a lot like a badger claw to me. Um, so I did some of my, my early work as an undergraduate um, at that site to Tuvany, and I saw a lot of badger claws like this indicating um, that someone from that clan, that badger clan had been here before. And we do know that um, the Hopi have oral traditions and other ways of knowing that they were up here in Utah on part of their great migration to get to the Hopi mesas. So um, that it would be really interesting uh, to invite some folks out and get other people's opinions on this because this to me looks an awful lot like not just a badger, but badger clan. I've just got a couple more. I know we're getting low on time. Um, we have on this rock, before I, I cut over to the drawing of it, we have two interesting things going on. Um, let me maybe toggle back and forth. First, I'll talk about what the images are and then I want to talk about something called repatination. So what I see here is this abstract curvilinear design that I would think is, you know, maybe on the older side, maybe that late archaic. And then over here, someone who might be Fremont, this might be a human head with some ear bobs on it. Um, and then a, a, a body and then something really interesting going on on their sides or on their arms. I've got those two. And then over here, we've got someone who is a horned Fremont person. Um, that's a really common motif is having a headdress on. Usually in the South, you get those horns um, somewhere like Moab area. And then this guy that um, I'm afraid he doesn't come across really well in this drawing, but he looked to me in real life an awful lot like a buffalo. And we do have images of buffalo um, nearby at places like Nine Mile Canyon. We don't believe that buffalo ranged that far south. It's possible, but we don't find any buffalo bones out here. We do find them up further north in Idaho. Okay, 
So I would say this is an interesting abstract archaic. This one is a big old question mark between late archaic and Fremont. And this I would think is definitively in the Fremont period. Now I wanna to toggle back if I can. Great. This is the, the image of it and looking at the repatination of it or how dark the pectin petroglyphs are compared to that parent material. You can see this pretty lightly. And here it looks a lot like um, a spiral with like some rays coming out of it. And it, it could be, it's hard to say. Um, but this is fairly light. This Fremont figure is fairly light. And you can see this is starting to be repatinated. Um, the rock is literally rusting. And then if you come down here to these Fremont ones, allegedly later, they're awful dark. They're darker in fact than that parent material on the top of it. So this is just to say that dating these things is not a precise science. Um, repatination occurs at a variety of different rates. It's really hard to know. Um, there's some there's some thoughts that maybe you can start dating some of the lichen, but I, you know, I, boy, it is tough dating these, I guess is my takeaway from this slide. <laughs> um, so we'll, we'll fade this out one more time just to show you um, what, a, what a wild and beautiful image, series of images this is. Okay, so I think the Smith Preserve is such a fun challenge, like a brain teaser because so many people lived around Utah Lake in prehistory. Utah Valley was undeniably the center of culture and anyone coming to this metropolis from that yawning desert to the West would have walked around Utah Lake and would have been impressed by what they saw. A lot of places that feel to us today like the middle of nowhere were the center of the universe at earlier points in time. This area attracted people to it like a magnet to create rock imagery. And that story is on the stone forever in a cacophony of voices, thousands of images calling out for attention, thousands of years between us and their creators and thousands of years between the last creator and the very first. This place is ancient and special. And thanks to the work of the Smith family, the Archaeological Conservancy and you, it is staying safe on our watch. That is my presentation for the evening. Thank you all. That was amazing. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, I don't know if there's any other questions that came in, but. Oh yeah, um, there's gonna be a few. I'm, I'm here to answer mind. any questions, but yeah. I know we might go over like, maybe I'll just go over by a few minutes. Is that okay with you? I'm. I'm fine for as long as you guys are. Sorry, I took up the whole time. I talked too long. Please, no, it was wonderful. It was very engaging. I learned a lot about just, <laughs> petroglyphs are sort of my passion too, you know, oh. so that was really fascinating. I don't know. I don't know a lot about that area. So I'm sure we all learned a lot. So, oh, um, so do you mind if I backtrack to some of the questions we missed from the middle? Because there was just a handful of them. Whatever you think. And guys, again, if we don't get to your question tonight, you have my email and I'll put it there in the chat. Go. Perfect, perfect. Because we probably will not get to all of them, but we'll do our very best. Um, we did have um, someone ask about, and they said, what do we know about the Fremont and archaic people's relationship with astronomy? And are there any astro astronomical sites along the Utah Lake? Along Utah Lake? Uh, I don't know of any along Utah Lake. Um, but the short answer is yes, we do have rock imagery. Gosh, I was just, someone was just telling me the other day. Yep, okay, so we do have rock imagery sort of towards the center part of the state that um, does function as a equinox calendar. Um, I don't think it has solstice markers and I don't think it has lunar markers. So I think it's just the, the solar solstice, the, um, the uh, winter and summer solstices. But yeah, so we do have that in the Fremont world. Around Utah Lake, we haven't seen anything like that. Um, we do have, someone is in the chat saying, oh yeah, there's sites in Vernal and like Rangeley, Colorado. So like it's, it's out there. Um, 
But the problem around Utah Lake is we have a lot of vandalism out there. A lot of rock imagery has walked away, which is somewhat mind boggling to think about. Um, but even in the 1970 site records for this, the archeologist who recorded it was like, yeah, I'm pretty sure that some of these are in the front yards of people out in Provo and American Fork. So it's some of these things have been moved and modified. Um, we certainly don't know every inch of the landscape. So I would not be surprised to find something that is a calendar or has some other celestial events connected with it. I'm gonna kind of jump back and forth between new questions and old questions, just to try to get some in there. <laughs> yeah, no, I appreciate it. Um, and some of, one of the newer questions is, has anyone attempted imaging in other spectral bands besides white light, such as ultraviolet or infrared? Uh, not that I know of in Fremont rock imagery. Um, if you are a rock imagery researcher, come to Utah. We have so much stuff out here. And I feel like a lot of places like Chaco get, get a lot of the spotlight. I mean, it's good too, but yeah, no, not as far as I know of, not that I've read. So one of the earlier questions was regarding artifacts that you guys may have found related to fishing. Have you found, can you talk a little bit about some of the artifacts you found related to fishing? Yeah, so um, those fishing nets are really hard to find. Two reasons, right? Um, one, the availability of places that you would find them are slim. You're really only gonna find them in really dry contexts. So we have a lot of open sites, not gonna find them just out in the open. And the second thing is, um, whereas you might leave behind a matate because it's heavy, you are not leaving behind your fishing net. It took you so long to build and um, it is so lightweight that we don't find them a lot because they probably were used until they just fell apart in the water. So we don't find a lot of those. What we do find are those sinkers or net weights on the side. And so you get yourself a nice big net and um, you throw it out into the lake, but you need to make sure that you're actually capturing your fishies. Utah Lake and the Great Salt Lake too um, are really shallow. They're only a few feet deep. So you can, you can throw your net out and it will sink to the bottom and capture your fish. And then you can grab them up, haul them out, get your friends, do it again. Um, so those are really the only two components of fishing that we have. Um, we don't see any um, fishing weirs. We don't see any fishing poles. Um, presumably people were probably also fishing with spears. Um, you could hunt with a bow and arrow. I've seen people doing that out on my local reservoir, which is very cool. I don't know how successful that is. Um, but yeah, we, we don't, we don't see any other techniques for fishing. We really just see those nets. Okay, so one of the older, so I think, okay, that was one of the older questions. Let's go to the newer, one of the newer questions now. Um, one of our viewers says, you mentioned the age of these petroglyphs go back to 2000 BC. What is the age of the oldest petroglyphs in North America and where are they in South America? That's kind of a broad question. So you may not actually know the answer to that. Yeah. Gosh, I don't know. I don't know when people first started making rock imagery across North America. Um, in this area and across the Great Basin, it's it's really that late archaic period. And 2000 years is even really pushing it. Like, I don't expect that we actually have a lot from 2000 years ago. Um, I am really sorry. I can ask her if you email me your information, I'll try to find you the answer and I'll get it to you, but I don't know right now. Well, I said that was a pretty hard question to answer <laughs> since it's very difficult to actually um, Definitively date rock art anyway. Oh, so it's thesis you know. level hard, guys. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But I mean, it's a good question, but you know. Yeah, um, good. Let's see here. Someone asked earlier, I realize you talked mainly about the portion of the greater archaic period, but do paleo people exist around Utah Lake? Yeah, so we find a lot of evidence of um, paleo Indian or paleo archaic people actually like a couple mountain ranges further west. So um, that lake, Utah Lake, did exist um, throughout most of the time when people were out here, which is about you know 13,000 years starting. Um, but it might not have been like as great a place as it seems like further out in um, a place called Dugway was. So out there, we have an, a place called the Old River, the Old River Delta, that cuts through what is now just 
flat playa, just a salt barren wasteland. Absolutely, like nothing is out there. Um, and so these sites are so delicate now, they're actually blowing away every time the wind blows. And every time the wind blows, moves some dust, we find more Paleo-Indian sites. Um, we're actually at the Utah Shippo hosting a whole talk about this in May. So if you want more information, um, email me or follow us on Facebook um, and we'll let you know about it. But I was out there um, talking to an archeologist named Darren Duke, who's gonna, who's gonna have a talk on this in May. Um, and he had found a, um, a really greasy fire hearth. They thought that maybe it was duck or goose grease. Um, and this would have been in a really marshy area again. And they also found a Western stemmed tradition point. So an old spear point that when they tested it for blood residue, it tested positive for um, uh, pachyoderm blood for probably mammoth out there. And so the thought is that this is one of the last mammoth refuges. This is one of the last places that mammoth could possibly eat in a biomass to keep themselves alive. Um, and so it's a very, it's such a cool site. Um, so yeah, we don't have a lot of that around Utah Lake. Um, the most that we ever find really are, are a couple of odd spear points here and there, but our real hotbed of paleo archaic activity is in the Old River Delta area. And um, there's a monograph on that. If you want, I can share that monograph with you. It's, it's very cool. I think I literally have two questions left if you don't okay. mind answering them. Because sure. it looks like that's the cut. I'm going to cut that off after after we get to these. At some point, probably. <laughs> <to consider. laughs> so someone asked, what kind of house would be, uh, would the archaic people have lived in? And they presumed that it wasn't pit houses or teepees, but were they brush houses? Mm -hmm. um, you know, something that wouldn't survive that you could find. Yes, we have one. And I didn't. I didn't include it in this talk because I was focusing on rock imagery, but we have one of these at Smith. I don't know, Emily, do you want to talk about it? You're, you're like the person at Smith. You're the, the lead steward. Um, and if you want to talk about that wiki up. Sure, I'd love to. So we have a feature at the Smith Preserve that we believe could possibly be a wiki up structure. And so what a wiki up is, is they build, they dig down a bit and then build a base with rocks and then use tree branches or sagebrush, really whatever greenery or plant life they can find to uh, build a dome. And then that becomes a temporary structure for the person living in that temporary space to occupy while they're there, whether that be for a season um, or a few days. And the rocks may remain as they do now at the Smith Preserve for them to come back next time that they visit the spot and build it back up. Yeah. The one at Smith, I love. It's got a doorway to the east. It's got a little grinding stone nearby. Like it's, it's a textbook wiki up. It's very nice. Okay. The very last question was about if you all had found evidence of any rabbit nuts. What is a rabbit nut? I know. I'm not sure. Um, but since I was going to see, I was going to test you to see if maybe you knew what that meant, but I think what I'm going to do at the end of all this, you're going to get a transcript from me of all the chat, all the Q&A that has email addresses. So you can address that later, or they, like you said, they can email you later for questions too. So if there's something that's not clear, you guys can work that out in an email. How's that? I would, I would love that. I'm interested in what a rabbit nut is. <laughs> is, it is it edible? Is it edible? I don't know. <laughs> Um, but yeah, very cool. Um, and, uh, Emily too, like, I want to give her the opportunity to plug, um, you can tour the preserve, right? Absolutely. We would love to have visitors at the preserve. I will drop our email address in the chat. You can also get that from Elizabeth. If you've already, uh, recorded her email address. We do public tours every Saturday in April and May, and you can follow us on Facebook and find um, the information about how to register for those particular events. But you can always reach me at this email address that I'll drop in the, the chat. And we can arrange a time for a steward who's been trained by the state of Utah with their cultural resource stewardship program to take you on a tour of the preserve. And we would love to have you there.
Yeah. And if you get out there between now and May 1st, you might see me out there working. So. Oh, rabbit nets, not rabbit nuts. <laughs> awesome. Rabbit nets. Um, I don't know of any rabbit nets out there. Again, the, the net like infrastructure that we have are those stone sinkers um, because rock lasts almost forever out here. Um, so we don't see any rabbit traps, but um, I can tell you from experience, it is chucky chock full of rabbits out there and you would be silly to not try to capture some of those. I'm sure Emily has seen those too and, and deer. Boy, there's a lot of deer out there and antelope. Well, that was wonderful. And if, does anyone else have any more parting thoughts or anything before we conclude? I mean, I'm always happy to say um, part, of, part of what I do here is I work to protect archeological resources. I love talking about them, but I need them to stay here for future generations. At the beginning, we talked about the absolutely incredible job that indigenous peoples have done stewarding these areas across time. Um, now that's that's our burden, right? And the Archaeological Conservancy does incredible work on it. Um, but if you could go um, to, boy, this is going to be a mouthful. Um, I think it's bit.ly slash pledge to SAV save. Um, and I'll put it in the chat. Um, you can learn more about our pledge to protect the past and our stop archaeological vandalism program. We every year lose more archaeological sites to damage. Um, and it's a real shame and it doesn't have to happen. So um, please, before you go out this year, educate yourself on and educate your friends on how to visit sites respectfully. Um, and I, I deeply appreciate your help in that. Well, thank you guys. And we're happy to add all of that, all of the tour information on our website and stuff like that too. So, so Please. people can look there as well. So thanks. Um, well, thank you so much, em Elizabeth. It was wonderful. And Emily, everyone who attended all of our attendees tonight, it was really informative and really amazing. So thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you. This has been really fun. And thank you guys for the, the really great questions. I, I loved it. Thank you. Thanks for hosting this. Oh yeah, you're, it's, and, and anybody who wants to watch it or wants to pass it on to their friends, it'll be available on our YouTube channel tomorrow. So check it out and check out our website for future virtual lectures. So thank you guys for attending and we'll see you next time. Have a wonderful evening. Thanks, good night everyone.